This is the poet and the poem from the Library of Congress. I am Grace Cavalieri, and today we are talking about memory. And preserving the beloved is one of the greatest assets for poetry. And today we've invited Jean Murray Franklin, who has put together a treasure box of memory. And we're going to ask her why she did this, how she did this, and the product is a beautiful book which has taken years to assemble and is a way of making a human being permanent forever. Jeannie, just think about putting this together and tell us what all is in this book. Well, the book is a compilation of my mother's poems. And I decided to pair those with vintage photographs in terms of recreating the story of her life through her poetry and essays. And there's some science fiction in there too. What's that about? Mom shared a love of science fiction with her brother, George. And uh, so she wrote a short story that is quite prophetic and it's still relevant even today. This is a real treasure trove when you open this book, because what strikes me the most is lots of people write about their mothers who are deceased. Lots of people want to make them permanent. But when I read this book, I feel I know this woman. How do you think that happened? Well, Grace, that was exactly what I hoped to achieve in compiling the book. Um, it started with one of her poems called Remember Me, and it really spoke to me. And so I thought about a way uh, to keep her memory alive and through that keep her alive and keep, a, keep her close to us. And um, it just sort of evolved as I went through the poems and the, and the pictures together. Now she died in 1999 and this book has just come out. So was this a process of all these years? It was off and on. After my mom passed away, my siblings and I, you know, divided up her possessions, kept the things that were special to us. And I kept her books of poetry. Mm. But several years... Several years later, I started missing some of the other old photographs and things that I knew were in existence, but I didn't have access to anymore because my sisters and brother and I are, live far apart. So one day I had a scanning party at my house and I invited them over and we had food and I asked them to bring back those boxes of photos and documents. And that was about six years ago. And so after that, I uh, had a period of scanning everything in that I thought was interesting or relevant or dear to me. So yeah, it took this long to do that. Well, let's start with the heart of this woman. What is her name? And read us a poem. Well, her name is Ethel Grant Murray. The first poem I can read is called I can choose. I can choose the way that I wish to live, choose to withhold or choose to give. I can choose to be happy, choose to be sad, choose to be anything good or bad. I can choose to be the person I want to be, choose to feel chained, choose to feel free, free to dwell without guilt or shame, to square my shoulder and play life's game. Play each inning to win, not lose. I have the wonderful, magical right to choose. You know, that is a fabulous philosophy. Is that really the way she was? Yes. <laughs> she, you and said she had books of poems? Did she literally? She read? left. She left a notebook of her handwritten poetry. And you I, transcribed it? Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. And what do you love about that poem? 
this one resonates with me because I remember her, I remember once riding in the car with her and feeling upset about something that was going on in my life. I was a teenager at that time. And she expressed that I could choose how I dealt with it and I could choose how I felt about it. I don't even remember what the incident was, but apparently it was something I could not change. And so I didn't, I wasn't aware of this poem at the time. And so it's just very interesting that she really did uh, adopt this philosophy and she shared it with me at a time when I really needed to hear it. So there's another aspect of this book. When you come across that poem, it sparkled a memory in your life. So it really is multidimensional. Although that memory is not in the book, for your family, as they read these words, it's going to trigger certain events in their life. So it has sort of a second life, I would say. Absolutely. That is pretty interesting to me. What do you think a memory is worth? Why should we bother? Why don't we just go on and go about our business and create and make and do? Why keep the past? Well, that's an interesting question because as I've gotten older, memories have become more and more important, uh, particularly with regard to those we have lost, our loved ones. And even thinking back to over our lives and positive things that happened to us. So it's one way of keeping the individual alive, mm -hmm. um, but it also in reflecting helps us to continue on our journey while we're still here. That's a good point. Read us another poem. Okay. This one is Joy of Living. Sunlight, dusk, changes in the sky, in the stars, clouds, rain, heavenly rain, wrapping softly or drumming a message from God, a message of love to me. Summertime, bees humming, seeking the sweetness of flowers, joys in living things, laughter, kisses, Touching, a smile, a tear at goodbye, a hand holding mine, arms around me comforting, your arms giving comfort, love received and love given. The joy is in the giving. Do you remember actually seeing her write a poem? Uh, I remember her working in her room and, and writing in her books, yes. And when she, when you were very little, what is your recollection of her? What kind of a mom? Oh, we were so crazy about our mom. And she wrote poems about each of us. They're in the book. I saw the that. Five of us. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting because she, I mean, most mothers know their children really well, their intimate personalities, their strengths, their weaknesses. And she wrote about these things. And I was like a puppy under my mom. And I would follow her from room to room and just sit and watch. And I just enjoyed being in her presence. I remember her in the kitchen making homemade applesauce. Uh, she was just a delightful, sweet, mama and I miss her where are you in the constellation I'm the youngest one. Oh, the adored child the <laughs> youngest is always the adored child that's it <laughs> you're shaking your head I don't well, know about that I but, to... so you feel that she became artistic after you were a little bit older mom was artistic in different ways. She always appreciated literature and the humanities. And when I was in college, we got into that. We had to read the great books and she ordered them um, from Encyclopedia Britannica Company or, or something like that, the great books of the Western world. 
And all that stuff was so interesting to me. So she may have been writing at that time. I'm not sure. So she entered your life in every stage. When you were studying the humanities, she entered the humanities. She always was active in your life. And that's why you keep her active in her death. Mm -hmm. And I do want to hold this up again because what I do think is going to inspire people to do is think more about ancestry. We're coming to an age where we really want to save things because it seems that the electronic era has made everything move so fast and at the speed of light, really. I mean, if I can push a button and get to Hong Kong, time and space are very much compressed. So the question is, what do we choose to save and how do we choose to save it? And you have taken six years to put this together. Is that right? That's correct. And the layout is beautiful. I just want everyone to know that the photographs, the color rendering, it is really a work of art. Are you proud of it? I am. And um, I did work with a graphic designer ultimately online to help me bring my concept to fruition. So you um, talked you talk through it with someone and they helped you. Well, absolutely. read a, a, another poem. Tell us your mom's name and tell us one thing you want us to know about her. Mm-hmm. She was Ethel Grant Murray and she was a gentle, loving person and she conducted herself always in such an elegant manner she could laugh and joke with the best of us had a great sense of humor with dance in the house and and tease but even during times when she was stressed or depressed she carried herself with such a dignity uh, she really set an example for us, for for us all. Wow, what a thing to say. Now let us hear her in her own words. Okay, this poem is about life. Life is a precious melody, and each of us sings his own song. Our music is usually happy, light, and lovely. Then at times, it moves in a slower, lower cadence. Some others' tunes blend with ours in beautiful harmonies, which take flight and ride the wind to the stars, while others sound discordant notes, which cause our own to slide off key. But if we move to the beat of our very own tune, forgetting all distractions and distortions, then our whole life can be a beautiful song, making harmonies along the way, because we will it so. Coming through all of her work is this idea that you can create your own reality, Mm -hmm. that your attitude really shapes your destiny, that you can decide to have a certain kind of life. Is that, is that an accurate description of her? It is on a very subtle level. With mom, it wasn't as though she was lecturing each and every one of us or having these lengthy talks with us. She was an artsy, private individual, but it was by demonstration, I noticed in hindsight, how she conducted herself that has really helped me (laughs) along the way, in retrospect. And you had that in your mind when you thought, how am I going to capture that on paper? Mm -hmm. That is such an abstract thing. She demonstrated a character and a depth that was unusual, you thought. Even as small as you were, you always noticed it compared to other women. You knew she was exceptional, right? I did. Question is, how do we preserve that so that it really makes a difference so that when people read your book, it's not just about your mom. What do you think when people read your book, it would trigger in them? Well, I would hope 
they would reflect on the, the beauty, the images and things she describes, how she felt about love and loving my father and her children working in her garden. She strove to be healthy and holistic. And that's not to paint a picture of her that she was perfect or anything. She wasn't a fairy godmother flitting around with a magic wand, but it was that long life in putting this book together and looking at the entire life story paired with my own personal me uh, memories and talking with my children and, and my siblings about mom. And then having the photographs, her story really emerges and crystallizes for people. To me, my mom was an overcomer. She had um, uh, challenges to overcome just as we all do in life. And it's not necessarily what those challenges are, but how you deal with them. And, and I so respect her ability to um, take, she, she took care of herself, her inner moods, her feelings, uh, and she applied those. She tried to apply them in her life. Um, and so that she was really ahead of her time <laughs> as far as that's, as far as that goes, I believe. I'm getting it. I really believe that you're talking about a person who was able to had insight into their lives and had a certain mindset and a will to find serenity and happiness in spite of much, all the speed bumps. But let us hear some more poetry from this beautiful woman. And her name is what? Ethel Grant Murray. You say it with such love. I do love her. This poem is entitled The Rape. Dying winter struggles to wreak his cruel will upon the prostrate form of earth, which for long dreary weeks he has forced to submit to his icy embrace, his frenzied thrashing and agonized throes ring from his weary victim a final submission. Then lovely earth begins to sense a gradual release from her bondage and ventures a deep shuddering sigh of relief. Supine, fainting, spent, and fearful of the struggle of renewed attack, she slowly gathers the remnants of her diminished strength. Cool cleansing showers refresh her. Bright dancing sunbeams encourage her. Languidly, she stretches quietly exulting in her newly found freedom. Hesitantly, carefully, she regains the use of her bruised, trembling limbs and stands upright. With arms extended in an unspoken plea, face upturned in shy yet eager anticipation, she anxiously awaits the warm, fervent kiss, the tender, comforting embrace of her true love, spring. <laughs> So that poem is more or less the way her whole psychology worked. There is something which is not, not really uh, pleasant in the beginning. And then it evolves into a resolution that is. And that is the way you describe her. So you found that poem in a notebook in her own handwriting. And then you put it into, you transcribed it from line to line into a poem. The process was uh, tedious. I read the poems into text messages and texted them to my phone rather than by uh, that software that trans translates voice to print. So from the text message to the email, 
I just cut and pasted the poems into Microsoft Word and edited them from there. So that in and of itself was a process. I did most of the, I converted all of the poems. Um, there were a total of 40 some, and there are 30 some poems in the book, I believe 34. So it's also very fascinating to me that most of her poems are about love and nature and hugs and kissing babies and sunlight. And I mean, it's just fascinating. I did not realize what was going on inside of her mind at this time, but it obviously was something that motivated her and that she loved contemplating and writing about. So you know more about her after her death than you did her, during her life. Absolutely. That in itself is worth it all, I think. But one thing also about writing poetry is you can't write it unless you're in a certain, have a certain energy. It's called ego energy. So that is when she was most alive, when she was most energetic, and she mm -hmm. felt most like writing a poem. So that's why we get so much positivity. Um, I was interested in two poems about her marriage, and uh, they were on 29 and 38. I wonder if you'd read each of those to us and tell her, of course, it's not, the perspective may be very personal, but as a child looking at that marriage, how do you describe it? Well, that's very interesting. My parents had their ups and downs, I'm sure as most relationships have, but they maintained a continuity and a unity that I have always admired. Um, they were there for one another. Uh, they handled the business of the household. We never wanted for things or were in need. We celebrated beautiful holidays, dinners full of family and the grandchildren started coming along and my parents, you know, went over, not overboard, but my father would swoop all the grandkids to our house and you have two poems in this book, many poems about marriage. And the two that I wanted to hear were on page 29 and then another one on 38. And the book is Ethel Grant Murray. Yes. This poem is entitled Loving Thoughts. To long to be just where he is, to wish for always to be his to hold his hand, to touch his cheek, to find the solace which I seek, to talk of multivaried things, converse, commune till my heart sings, or silent sit, so we may be tranquil at ease, my love and me, to understand his every need, to laugh together, sing or read, to keep him cheerful, calm, serene, to thrill him as he's never been, to comfort him if need there be, to have him turn for this to me, to ne'er between us build a wall, to want to please him most of all, to have him trust his faith to me and give him mine, whate'er may be, through tasks or cares, illness or health, for each to be the other's wealth, to honor him throughout my life, to be his best friend, sweetheart, wife, to cherish him with all of me. This is what loving has to be. Do you agree? Yes. <laughs> let's, hear the next, let's hear the next one. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's very profound, yes. Don't ask me if I love you. <clears throat> Don't ask me if I love you, just look into my eyes. Don't question that I deeply care for I cannot disguise the joy I feel at being near in moments far too few, the counting of the days between the times I'll be with you. 
And the next one goes, daylight dims, darkness creeps about, writhing on its belly, searching for me. Rain cascades down, drumming its fingers to the plaintive tune of my lonely sighs and my hidden tears. Time drags its feet, clocks stand still. The night will not move. There is only a vacuum, a nothing when you go away. Did she read a lot of poetry? Because she has a very facile way of using words. That doesn't come from nothing. She absolutely loved literature. And she would call me in to share a phrase or uh, explain a word that she was using for the first time. And this poem really reminds me of it, the last one about darkness creeping about, writhing on its belly. She loved turning a phrase and um, she did share those things with me and the little excitement she felt when she tried something new. Were you alone with her as the youngest child? Fairly much so. I was wondering these intimate moments that are so precious, what, what is the age between you and your older sibling? The sibling next to me uh, is Joyce's three years between Joyce uh -huh. and me. Three. And all together, like they're every three years? Fairly much so. So the, the oldest two were paired. They socialized together. The next two socialized together. And I was sort of left at home, float, drifting around, uh, floating around pursuing my art and my writing as well. I mean, I was perfectly fine with that. I was in my element. So I, get, I suppose that is why we shared uh, this thing, this poetry thing. I agree because I think my youngest child is more in tune with my writing life because she, her sisters were off, you know, and um, as you say, they bonded with each other. And then the youngest was left to her mother's thoughts, which mm -hmm. then resulted in your gathering her life in a book, which Absolutely. is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. And before we hear a final poem, what do you wish people to really know about preserving a memory? What did you find out about your mother that you didn't know? And isn't that really the benefit of this, that you thought you were putting together artifacts and all of a sudden you, you saw a person emerge that was behind these, a person additional to the one that was in flesh and blood. Just talk about that as the author for a moment, the benefit of that. I mean, it's really quite a miraculous thing to create a person that will never go away. And, but yet it's a different person from the one who lived, let's be honest. Oh, absolutely. I appreciate your insight on that uh, because that is exactly what happened for me in the process. That's another reason why it took so long because I was digesting things and my project was changing and shifting as I was working on it. But the, the biggest blessing came in the response from my family, particularly the younger kids, our children, um, who all received a copy of the book. The book has done exactly what I wanted it to do, which was open up my mother's life to them so that they could see her not just as their grandmother, but as a human as a child, as a young woman, as a teenager, um, as, and then as a wife and mother and grandmother. And um, everybody has said they've learned things about the, her that they didn't know or just didn't realize before. She was a prolific vegetable gardener and those kinds of things. I mean, she worked her gardens and her gardens were bountiful. She, did homemade canning and
gifted friends and family with fresh produce and pickles and relishes. And she did it with such joy. She was so happy to share um, that aspect of her life. But I'm sure that toiling in the gardens was very cathartic for her, contemplative and um, being out in the sunshine. And it's it all flows together. Yes. Um, her way of dealing with life's ups and downs and and moving through her life, growing was, old and, um, and all of that. A and so it, it was a meditative life. It was very much so. We get that. And then when you became a lawyer, do you believe that, uh, I know many lawyers who are poets actually, do you believe that your love of language, I mean, lawyers use language in a certain way, but don't you think that enhances your own love of language? Absolutely. Studying? Yeah, because this is all, the use of language is all that the law is, right? Absolutely. There's definitely a correlation. And it goes even as far as the administration of the law, writing it first and, and choosing the words, but then you have to actually administer it. And in doing so, we're contemplating issues that we find in the humanities, mm. in the classics, good and evil, right and wrong. So I do see a correlation in the disciplines. I love that remark, Jeannie. We are talking to Jeannie and her mother, Ethel Grant Murray. Her daughter is Jeannie Murray Franklin. And we're going to have a closing poem. If I were a sunbeam, I'd wake you at dawn. I'd kiss your cheek softly as day is begun. If I were the south wind, I'd sing you a song of loving and caring and hearts ever young. If I were a raindrop, I'd lull you to sleep, tapping gently, so gently, my vigil I'd keep. If I were a rainbow, I'd shine the day through, bringing warm, joyous laughter and love just for you. This is the poet, the poem from the Library of Congress. We're on location. The production is made by Forestwood Media Productions, post-production by Mike Turpin, MET Studios. We wish to thank the Library of Congress for making the program possible. Funding is provided by the Ravada Foundation of the Logan Family and the Sinibit Fund. I am Grace Cavalieri. Our engineer is Mike Turpin. <laughs>